So I'm very sorry, I will stay as long as I will be able to do that. And then uh, just to give you time, I'm switching off. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I would like to say that it's my pleasure uh, to be giving this presentation today. Um, I can also understand perfectly well um, uh, that uh, the situation is fluid, so it might also be that my daughter pops, pops in at some point, but uh, probably we'll uh, be on our own. Um, so um, today um, I will um, I will talk about low field relaxation and uh, thermal mixing in bullet dynamic nuclear polarization. And the structure of the talk is such that I will first um, talk about bullet DNP, what that is. So if you think you know that already, you can grab a coffee for 10 minutes and come back. Um, and then I will uh, talk about low field relaxation and thermal mixing and maybe how we, what we think might be going on. Um, and then I did want to give an update about uh, bullet DNP developments at KIT. And, and although I hope that we would have been, uh, that we would have advanced a little bit further, um, there's still something to show, so I'll give you a short update. Um, this is the team here. Um, so we have myself, Hannah, and Karel. And that was also already the team when we were still in Southampton. Uh, um, and now, since then, we are now we're in Karlsruhe and we have uh, Michael, who is a student in our group, but we've stayed small. So our plan was to first um, get our instruments up and running again and then um, maybe grow the team. Whether that was a good idea, I don't know, but that's what we did. <clears throat> okay, so what is bullet DNP? And maybe also what is maybe the potential of bullet DNP? So, um, I mean, to get the bigger picture of that, um, we maybe have to think what is actually magnetic resonance and maybe also what is the uh, global importance of these two things. And of course, magnetic resonance spectroscopy is, uh, is a prime tool to uh, study the structure and dynamics of molecules. And so that's also an important market for that reason. And then, of course, we have magnetic resonance imaging, which uh, is, of course, hugely important in medicine and is a much bigger market. And there you measure the structure of, well, let's say the human body and other bodies. And you can also, to some extent, measure the dynamics. And so these are very important non-destructive probes, but they are both limited by weak signals. And so the signal that's also important for, for, uh, for this talk and in general, the signal in NMR is of course uh, the polarization, that is how strongly the nuclear spins are aligned. And then you have to multiply that also with the concentration, okay? So if you have fewer molecules, you have less signal. And the next thing that is important is that, of course, the acquisition time scales as the inverse square of the signal. So that means if you somehow achieve a factor 100 in signal, then you have a 10,000 fold reduction in acquisition time. And uh, I mean, this is this very uh, famous experiment that was conducted with hyperpolarized pyruvic acid, where you uh, um, see um, a patient uh, with an identified tumor here and uh, then they injected uh, hyperpolarized pyruvic acid and now you can because it's hyperpolarized you get such a strong signal from the pyruvic acid that you can actually track it inside the living human body and not only that you can also then measure uh, as how it converts to lactate because the chemical shift changes and then you can make a map of this conversion and uh, uh, and then you can use that as an indicator for, for potential tumor. And in, in fact, in this case, that was then later confirmed by biopsy. So that, is, that is, uh, gives you an idea of what you can do when you have a very high polarization. And how is this done? Um, so you achieve the high, po high polarization uh, with this uh, famous dissolution DNP experiment. Um, and in that experiment, you go to temperatures of one Kelvin and a field of seven, several Tesla, so nowadays maybe more seven or nine Tesla, and then the electron spins are fully polarized. And then you 
couple the electron spins to nuclear spins, say carbon-13 in this case. And so thereby you can now fully polarize the nuclear spins. And that has also been, that has been known for many decades now. But then uh, Jan Henrik uh, and, and his co-workers invented this uh, great thing that they would dissolve this hyperpolarized solid and then transfer it over to another magnet. And uh, so now you are here, right? Now you have a solution which is at a much higher temperature. But if all goes well, you still have the same polarization. So then your enhancement, that's this enhancement figure that you get, is maybe 10 to the 5 of that order. Okay, but of course, now you have to deal with relaxation because this is a non-equilibrium polarization and it will just decay with T1. In fact, it will, of course, already decay during the transfer because the transfer takes time. And there's another issue that um, we have to think about and that is dilution. And there are really two aspects to that. So if you want to inject something into a human body or if you are interested in maybe a chemical reaction and there is already an upper limit uh, to the amount of, of, or to the concentration that you can have in your final solution, then generally the dilution is not a problem here because you anyway have to dilute your, uh, uh, your analyte to the required level. If, however, let's say you want to just, um, um, you just want to say get a spectrum of some, some uh, substance and you don't actually know what's in there, then of course this dilution is a huge, huge problem. Yeah, because then ideally you would build a detector that just holds whatever sample you have. And if you dilute hundredfold, uh, then you basically have hundred times less, uh, less signal or you, you can argue maybe with the square root if you increase the detector size, but it is a sig very significant problem. Okay, so let's see how this uh, dissolution DNP experiment is done. Uh, typically. So this is a very, very simplified sketch, but I think it captures the essence. So you have a sample at a, in, in liquid helium, so it's cooled in, in liquid helium, and then you irradiate it with microwaves and thereby you somehow transfer the electron polarization to the nuclei. We don't have to get into the details of that. And so the, then the nuclear spins become polarized, and then what you do, you actually, um, like in the, in the very old version, you, you lift this up so that it's not in contact with the liquid helium anymore. And then you flush hot solvent uh, through, through a tube. And then the, what you get out is uh, just the dissolved material in solvent. And then you can push this through a tube into another magnet and there it arrives. And so this really works. And it's also been quite impressive that there has been there have been only 10 years between the proof of concept for this technology to the first clinical studies with, with humans. Um, and also the polarization uh, that can be achieved on, on certain molecules like pyruvate is, uh, is very high. Okay, but in terms, of, um, in terms of spectroscopy, at least, and in particular, if you want to just uh, uh, look at uh, say a given molecule, um, there are two things. One is uh, that the transfer here is inherently slow. If you try to push liquid through a tube over several meters and the tube is small, um, then of course you can increase the pressure, but in principle you always need, uh, I think if, you're, if you don't give, uh, pay a lot of attention, then you can do it in a few seconds. And if you push it really hard, uh, then you can maybe um, do it in one to two seconds. And um, there's also an issue here, as I said, with dilution. Um, so at least in our hands, this always required solvent amounts of several milliliters. So let's say maybe two or three, um, if we, uh, uh, and, and maybe you can push that a little bit, but of course, if you take a too small amount of solvent and you inject that into this cold region here, then it will just freeze and you will not be able to retrieve uh, uh, the, the hyperpolarized solution. Okay, um, so, now, it could have been that we were thinking about this long and hard and then came up with a solution, but that was not actually what happened. Um, in fact, something else happened when uh, I was still in Southampton. Uh, we had these fantastic molecules. And um, so this is H2O at C60, so a water molecule in a fullerene cage. And I'm not going into the details of this experiment today. But uh, basically, we knew already that we can enrich para water in these, uh, 
in these cages just by equilibrating the sample at, at low temperature like 5 Kelvin for a long time. And then of course uh, you would assume that this para water converts back to ortho water uh, once it's under ambient conditions again. And then we have done some experiment with uh, actually methyl, uh, carbon labeled methyl groups in, in gamma picoline where we've seen quantum rotor induced polarization from this. So it was a complete analogy that you should be able to observe the same effect in, in these molecules. But we were not able to observe the effect and we said, okay, it can be, maybe it converts so quickly um, that we don't see it uh, because it converts already during the transfer. And the other issue was that we indeed had a very low signal to noise uh, ratio uh, because this doesn't have a high solubility in anything pretty much. And um, then we had the additional um, dilution due to the dissolution of the frozen sample. Um, but in this case, of course, we didn't need to transfer magnetization. So that's a, a special thing here. We just needed to transfer the ro rotational state uh, of the water molecule safely. And that, that doesn't uh, depend on magnetic field. So what we decided to do, so after that we failed with the, with the standard dissolution DMP instrumentation, we decided, uh, sorry, actually I have to go somewhere else. So um, yeah, I get, I get there in a moment. So um, I'm sorry, I, I uh, lost my way. Um, so, and, and now let's, let's quickly go here. This slide is about, is dissolution DNP a tool for spectroscopy? So we, we easily get the signal enhancements of a factor of 10,000. So that's basically that, that's the promise of DNP. But now we have dilution. So let's say we have 10 to 100 fold dilution. So actually the signal is not 10,000 times stronger than what we would have if we, if we just put the pure substance into our uh, sample tube. Um, and um, then there's another thing, and that is, uh, has to do with the polarization buildup, uh, amongst other things. But the polarization buildup takes uh, takes long time, maybe two hours, maybe four hours. If you say two hours, actually, that would correspond to running 12 experiments per day. So because the other thing is that, that it takes so much time is because it is very labor intensive right now. Um, it it uh, involves a lot of manual work, whereas if you just run uh, standard spectroscopy, of course, the spectrometer does it on its own with a sample changer. Um, so let's say you are very busy and you run 12 experiments every day. I don't think there's any lab on earth that really runs 12 dissolutions every day, but I may be wrong. Then you have two hours. But if you just record uh, thermal spectra, maybe you need 10 seconds for one spectrum. Okay, this is maybe an arbitrary number. But then basically you can also signal average in, in this time, right? So if you have, um, if you have four, four hours, you have a lot of time for signal averaging and you get a factor of 40 in signal to noise just from signal averaging. And then maybe um, there's also a problem in the solution DNP that maybe the spectral quality is uh, not always as high as you'd want it. So maybe you get a little line broadening on top. And now you go, and take your factor of 10,000 and divide it by these factors, right? So you have this, but you have to divide um, by the dilution and also by the lost uh, signal averaging. And then you have basically a net enhancement, which is of the order of one to 10. And so I think that actually, then many people would just conclude, okay, dissolution DNP is a very fascinating technology and it has, some great applications, but you would never use it just for signal enhancement. Um, and uh, yeah, so what can you do about that really? Okay, so back to the uh, quantum rotors. Um, what we did there, because we didn't have to uh, transfer any magnetization, we decided that this would be quite easy. We would just put this uh, material into some capsule um, and then uh, we put that into a like steel tube that we bent into U-shape, uh, put some valves on it, and then we would just shoot it over to the other magnet. And uh, there we would dissolve it. And so I'll not go into the results of this today. Uh, you can read about those here if you want. So we did observe the effect in the end, so that worked. But importantly for us, um, I came and we came to realize how 
uh, quickly you can actually transfer a solid sample from one place to another. And uh, so this is something that you or anyone can find out. And if you open a cylinder, you also know that immediately the gas comes out at the other end of the tube. Um, but we actually then, so we measured this. So I, I built a little thing that has two optical detectors. So you have a, a light emitting diode and a photodiode on the other side here and here, here and there. And then we just uh, shoot the capsule through this. And what we saw was that it took um, four milliseconds to travel this distance and that's 30 centimeters. Okay, so from that we worked out that it's moving rather quickly and that we can, um, so we have speeds of typically 100 meters per second uh, and that's, you don't have to put any effort into that. And the transfer time, uh, then it means uh, for, for to, to go from one magnet to the other, that was of the order of 100 milliseconds, a bit shorter actually. Okay, so then we said, uh, wait, if, if it's that fast, then maybe we do survive relaxation at low field and maybe we can transfer the solid sample. So the idea was then that we built basically again a version of the YouTube that I've shown earlier, but now we put in a sample here with radicals and we irradiate those radicals with microwaves. That would be the first difference. We also need to have a little pathway now to immerse the sample in liquid helium so that it's nice and cold. And then we also said, okay, we need to make sure that the magnetic field, when we move the sample from here to here, that that doesn't go down too far. So we decided that we can achieve a minimum field of the order of maybe 100 millitesla. And so we put a solenoid around this entire path from here to there that actually goes into this magnet and also into that magnet. And then we put as much current through it as we can. And then we shoot it over. And now here we put it in, the, in this version in Southampton, we would put it into a, a solvent. There would be a solvent reservoir, so hot solvent waiting here. The NMR tube is already evacuated, there's a pump on it. And then we have a valve here, we open the valve. And so after this arrives and dissolves here, we open the valve and inject the solution into the NMR tube. Okay, so about this transfer field, how high should that be? So one thing we clearly wanted to avoid is to uh, go, come anywhere close to, uh, uh, to nuclear interactions, like proton-dipole-dipole interactions. And so we just want to have the spins quantized along the um, applied field. So from that perspective, it should be substantially larger than 2.5 millitesla. Okay, that's easy. Um, we have a rotation in there that I will, actually we will not have the rotation in the future anymore, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then of course we knew that probably relaxation would accelerate at lower fields and that there's also uh, thermal mixing possible, so we would maybe go as high as possible. And so if you just look what kind of power you can easily get, um, th that's of the order of tens of kilowatt. And if you just buy one big power supply, that can give you uh, of the order of 10 kilowatts. And for our solenoid around the tube, that transfers to, uh, converts to 70 millitesla of field that we achieve. <clears throat> uh, there's no video on that today, I'm afraid. So um, this is the experiment. So we energize this tunnel. This is the current in the, in the solenoid around the transfer tube. These are the optical detectors. Uh, that we have at the entrance and exit of the tunnel. So here you can see how much time the bullet needs to go from one to the other. Um, and then here you see a series of photographs uh, from uh, that, that document how the solution flows into the NMR tube. And basically um, time zero is when we uh, run the first uh, NMR uh, scan, like the first free induction decay. And the dilution here in this case was a bit less than tenfold actually. Okay, and these are the spectra. So you can see we, um, like from this doublet, you get the polarization level that's 30% on the pyruvic acid. And we had a solid state polarization we estimated to be 50%. So maybe we lost uh, some. You can also see that the lines are not uh, perfectly well resolved. So we do have some, uh, some line broadening here, which is 
uh, uh, due to helium, like small helium bubbles that we have to deal with. Um, okay. And uh, this has been published now uh, about a year, one and a half years ago. Yeah. Okay. Now, the question, of course, for everyone is what about relaxation during the transfer? We know that it's not terrible, right? We get substantial polarization across, but we, for example, we don't know uh, what governs the relaxation. We don't know what happens if we put in a different radical. Uh, um, we don't know all these things. So we wanted to study that uh, in, in some more detail, of course. And to do that, we, of course, need to know the sample conditions. And they are, okay, how long will it take for the sample to transfer uh, from one magnet to the other? Because, well, that's the time for the relaxation to take place. Then we need to know the field, but we also need to know the sample temperature because we're pushing it with helium gas and the helium gas is in contact with the wall of the tunnel. So it very quickly will have the temperature, ambient temperature. And so the sample will heat up and the heat capacity of the sample at very low temperatures is of course also very small. So it could heat up rather quickly. And to that end, we actually did an experiment um, uh, in, in Southampton still. And, uh, and what we did there is we equilibrated the sample. So we take one of these bullets, like these little buckets, and we put in a temperature sensor and our sample, the pyruvic acid. And then we equilibrate this arrangement in a dura above, it was actually above the helium, uh, above the liquid level. Um, so you can see here the temperature was uh, around about 20 Kelvin. And then we would very rapidly, as rapidly as we could, move it up uh, to a, to a uh, another position and that was also mechanically engineered so that it would end up in a precise position and at that position then helium gas ambient temperature helium gas would flow around the sample at very high speed so this was basically designed to uh, mimic the conditions that we have um, in, in a bullet experiment and here you can see the heating of the sample and this orange line is is just the guide to the eye with a gradient of 60 kelvin per second and we have to be aware, of course, that heating can be much faster at lower temperatures. So we know that above, uh, say, 30 Kelvin, it heats up at this rate, but it could heat up much faster below because of the smaller heat capacity. Um, so um, what we conclude from this is that the sample temperature during our transfer will stay below 40 Kelvin. That's just this figure that we put uh, on paper now. Um, so that we know where, where to look for relaxation. <clears throat> okay, so we have these conditions. Sample temperature is below 40 Kelvin. Field is approximately 70 millitesla. And the time at that field is 0.1 second. And then the question is how much polarization will we lose? And uh, a related question actually, uh, it's not, exact, not, the, not the same necessarily, is what is T1? <clears throat> Okay, there is actually previous data um, by, uh, by Lloyd Lumata's group. And I've, I've uh, shown a, a plot of, of this paper here. So the, if you look at the blue curve here, this is pyruvic acid with tritol. So this is exactly our sample. And this is at a temperature of 1.8 Kelvin. And they have observed that the T1 scales as a third power of the magnetic field. And at one Tesla, you have a T1 of approximately 30 seconds. So now if this were to continue like that to 0.1 Tesla, then you extrapolate that and you get a T1 of 10 milliseconds. So that is clearly not what is happening because then we wouldn't see any hyperpolarized carbon in our experiment. So the question is what happens instead? And of course, to find out, we need to use field cycling. And the field cycling, uh, um, instrument we have been using is actually the one that Tony Horswell built in Nottingham. I think uh, Tony is in the audience. Thank you, Tony. Um, and the instrument actually uh, uh, was, I think, then inherited by uh, John, John Oz Bradley, who also did these experiments with us. And now he has uh, donated this instrument to us, so we now have it at KIT. It's a very nice instrument still. It can ramp the magnetic field at four tesla per second. You can go up to two tesla. Temperature range is maybe two to 300 Kelvin. The only flip side to it is it uh, needs liquid helium and it needs uh, substantial amounts, which given the current pricing is um, a bit of a drawback. 
And then, so how do we do these experiments, uh, the T1 measurements? Um, let's say first forget about this stage two here, this is optional. So normally in, in, the, in the simple case, we just polarize the nuclei at the nuclei, uh, sorry, no, we don't polarize them. We, we, we actually go to a, this field and we saturate the polarization. So we kill it completely. And then we immediately go to stage three. And so that's a set field um, and there the polarization builds up. And then basically as a function of the time spent in this phase, we measure the signal intensity. Now, if this field here is uh, too small, then you end up with uh, too small polarization and you can't measure it anymore. So in that case, that happens typically at 0.5 Tesla. In that case, you polarize the nuclei at uh, two Tesla first, and then you drop the field, and then you measure this decay curve here. And uh, so again, you have this evolution period here, and you measure the decay, and that gives you the T1. Okay, and so here are the data that we have. So it's again pyruvic acid, uh, PA is for pyruvic acid, and we have trito. And so now we can combine, so these are actually Lloyd Blumata's data here, these crosses, and the dashed line is with the exponent of three. And now we have our data in here as well. So you can see that um, they actually match, but the exponent changes. Yeah? And uh, we have, so these, uh, these lines here have an exponent of one. So the T1 scales as linearly with the applied magnetic field. And that is the case for carbon, which we have here, and also for protons on the right side. Um, for carbons, it's true up to almost, well, maybe up to one Tesla at low temperatures. And for protons, maybe up to 200 uh, millitesla. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's keep this in mind. So it's actually good news for us, right? Because uh, this flattens off and the T1 is not so terribly short. Actually, it looks like uh, we have proton T1, like a carbon T1 of one second, and a proton T1, which is just a little bit, little bit shorter. Um, so that would be perfect news for us. Um, we don't have to worry about relaxation. Okay, but let's, um, let's look what else might be happening. So we wanted to understand this uh, relaxation, of course. And um, one of the things um, we did is, uh, is a comparison of the relaxation in this sample, pyruvic acid with triatil, to relaxation in neat pyruvic acid. Okay, so here the open symbols, the open blue symbols are neat pyruvic acid, and the circles are carbon, and the squares are proton, and then the filled uh, yellowish symbols are pyruvic acid with triatil. Okay, so we can see here that in neat pyruvic acid, the proton and carbon T1s converge at low field. So that's here. And uh, that's what you expect if there's thermal mixing. They should probably, well, they should become very similar. We also see that the triatil reduces proton and carbon T1s, except for protons above 0.5 Tesla. So if you look here, the the proton T1s are actually the same, whether there's triatil or not in the, in the sample. Um, so then probably some, there, there must be something else that, that's driving the relaxation for these. And uh, yeah, the question of course is how does triatil uh, cause relaxation? Um, and what drives the proton relaxation above 0.5 Tesla. Okay, so then if we, if we look at this this way, we have carbon spins in our sample, we have proton spins in the sample, and we have triatil. And uh, it looks that somehow the polarization uh, goes from via the triatil, at least at low field, and for carbon always, uh, to the lattice. And the question is, okay, does the triatil give this directly to the lattice? And it's actually um, possible, I know it because I've done it, to assume that it's a direct uh, lattice relax, uh, direct relaxation of the triatil to the lattice. And you can even, if you invoke a diffusion barrier, you can even uh, arrive at this uh, linear scaling of the nuclear T1 with the applied magnetic field, if you assume such a direct process. 
Um, but I did then thankfully consult Tom Wenkebach and uh, he alerted me to the fact that this is just much too slow for tritool um, at low fields because a direct relaxation uh, is very strongly dependent on the applied magnetic field and it becomes very inefficient at a uh, low magnetic field. And he, in his first response, basically said something, I don't know if you've just uh, listened to uh, Bob Griffin's talk, uh, but basically we should all pay a lot more attention to oxygen. So that's also uh, what Tom uh, said. And so we look at the role of oxygen now um, in, uh, for, for a bit. Okay, so the first thing, and this uh, uh, is something that Tom alerted me to, is that in the trito relaxation is very often driven, uh, or in this butanol samples, even at a field of two Tesla, it's driven by oxygen. Okay, so here you have different oxygen concentrations in your sample, and you see that basically the more oxygen you put in, the faster the trito relaxation becomes. So that means that the trito relaxation then is not dominated by direct relaxation, but it's going via the oxygen. Yeah, so the, the trito relaxes via the oxygen. We can, we also have, again, thanks to Lumata, this is really, these papers really give a lot of EPR data, which is incredibly useful for, for, for this work. We can also look at the um, trito T1. And we see here, so if, if you look at the low field, so that it's 9.5 and 95 gigahertz, uh, red triangles and, and black circles here, here at low temperature, you can see that you have a ch change in field of a factor of 10. And the, um, the T1 changes just by a factor of, uh, of 2.5 or something like that. So we can say that to uh, quite a good approximation, the electron T1 of the trito is actually constant at low field. Okay, there's also, um, um, uh, there are studies of oxygen uh, and protons. So proton relaxation, if you don't have trito, is also um, accelerated if you have oxygen in your sample. Um, so this is uh, data by uh, Jim Kempf and John Ross Bradley. And so these were also done in, uh, in Nottingham and uh, David Peet. And so you can see that uh, if you have oxygen in your sample, then it completely dominates the nuclear proton spin uh, lattice relaxation at, or, uh, at, at two Tesla. So oxygen has these two links. Uh, so now if, if we can look at energy flows at low temperature, and here basically I've put as dotted lines all the uh, flows that maybe are theoretical, and I have put as, uh, as dark red double arrows the, the flows that we see. Yeah, so we see that the trito relaxes the carbon and we also see that oxygen relaxes trito and then the oxygen, okay, we haven't seen that, but it has to dump its, the energy somewhere and so it's got to go to the lattice. Um, so I think all these links are there with quite high confidence. There's also a, a direct link from carbon uh, to proton, carbon to proton or proton to carbon. Um, we'll get to that a bit later. Okay, so now we have tritool, and before we, um, well, what, what's happening with tritool? Um, we have triple spin flips, or at least that's a, that's a something that is uh, quite corresponds quite nicely to what we observe. Okay, so triple spin flips. So we have a nuclear Zeeman Hamiltonian, we have the electron Zeeman Hamiltonian, and then we have electron spin spin interactions or so spin spin Hamiltonian. Uh, which is also called a non-Zeeman Hamiltonian. And uh, then we have, oh, there's a typo here actually. Um, uh, then of course we have um, hyperfine interactions to couple the electron spins to the nuclear spins. Now, the important thing is that uh, the non-Zeeman and the Zeeman Hamiltonians commute. And so therefore they, um, they, are, they form separate reservoirs. Um, and, so this is, this is shown here. Um, so you have a, a Zeeman reservoir and you have a non-Zeeman reservoir. And these both can be decoupled or they can maybe just couple via nuclear spins. 
and they couple independently to the lattice. So in our case, it's maybe not the lattice directly, it maybe couples to the lattice via oxygen. So we have these, these two, yeah? so it's not just triatol, it's not one blob, but the triatol is two blobs, namely the Zeeman and the non-Zeeman reservoir. <clears throat> And now in a tri triple spin flip, so in a triple spin flip, we have a flip of two electron spins and one nuclear spin. And um, so there is this um, paper again by Tom, um, where he described this. And basically there are two limiting cases of these triple spin flips. One is, uh, and that's what you have in magic angle spinning DNP, where you just have different Zeeman frequencies of the, of the two electrons. So you basically have two electrons and their splitting just matches the nuclear Lamo frequency and that's called the cross effect. But this energy does not have to convert to, uh, to electron. The nuclear ener Zeeman energy does not have to flow to um, electron Zeeman energy. It can also uh, go into this non-Zeeman interaction reservoir. And uh, that's then uh, called thermal mixing. So it's a bit, um, I think the nomenclature is, is still a bit um, confusing, um, to me at least. Um, but basically we have these two limiting cases depending on whether the uh, spin spin, the electron spin spin interactions are involved or the Zeeman interactions. Of course, in a realistic case, then they both contribute. <clears throat> Okay, now um, this non-Zeeman reservoir is, is though uh, perhaps a very interesting candidate to explain this relaxation uh, that, we, that we've observed. So I said we have a T1 that depends linearly on the applied magnetic field. So that means that the ability to dump nuclear Zeeman energy to the lattice is field independent because as you increase the field, then basically the nuclear Zeeman energy of course also increases in proportion. And therefore now, it, if you have twice the nuclear Zeeman energy, you now need twice as long to dump that energy to the lattice. And <clears throat> so this is actually a, um, a well-known thing. Uh, it's, it's described already in Abraham and Goldman's uh, book. Um, and it gives you this, uh, then if you just put the, look at that flow of energy, then you have this non-Zeeman reservoir relaxing with something and how quickly it can relax the protons depends on how big it is and also how much nuclear Zeeman energy it must, uh, it must uh, process, if you will. Okay, so if you have that, then as the electron spins become fully polarized, there's a, there's a, there would be a modification to this because you can think of if all the electron spins are lined up, of course, they cannot participate in any relaxation process anymore because uh, they are just fixed and, and uh, they can't uh, uh, take up energy or release energy. So there's, and, and that's this factor of one minus electron polarization squared. Um, that basically is a scaling factor to this uh, non-Zeeman Hamiltonian. And if you, so if you have this expression, now you have some constant and then you have uh, one over B times this, and you get this gray curve. And you can actually, if you look at the data, um, like for our data, it describes, of course, this linear thing just describes it accurately. And then you can also see a little bit of this bend, if you will, in Lloyd's data. But of course, you also see that it's uh, by no means a perfect fit. So whether this is really an accurate description here is maybe uh, open for debate at best. But let's say if we want to put a positive twist on it, we have here carbon T1s over four orders of magnitude and it would at least uh, roughly correspond uh, to, uh, to what we see. <clears throat> okay, now we have spoken about relaxation, um, carbons, protons, but we haven't spoken really about thermal mixing and now by thermal mixing I don't mean one nucleus mixing with the electron non zeeman interaction but we can also have a thermal mixing of the proton and carbon spin reservoirs right so that's something we have to keep in mind this is shown here so let's say for now we can completely forget about the lattice but we just look at the flow of energy from protons to carbons or the other way around 
So at very low field, it's well known that uh, since the 50s, I guess, that you can have a direct flow, basically, when the Zeeman interaction becomes comparable to the dipole, dipole interactions. For, of, uh, this is this yellow arrow here. But now there's also, of course, a possibility that, say, some proton uh, polarization flows to trito, and then in trito here you have this non-Zeeman reservoir, so both the protons and the carbons couple to it. So then also that way the protons can transfer polarization to the carbon via the trito, right? And how can we observe that? So that then we have these thermal mixing um, experiments, which are again field cycling experiments. So here we, we uh, polarize the protons and we saturate the carbon. And then we go to a mixing field for a, a set time. And then we go back to the detection field and we measure how much carbon signal intensity we have. <clears throat> okay, and this experiment I show first here was um, done already on pyruvic acid without trito. This is again without trito. And so this is again uh, experiments conducted in Nottingham. And what you see here is that at 100 Gauss, so 10 millitesla, the thermal mixing essentially stops. So this is a contour map and the curves are here. And you can see that if you wait longer for, for the mixing to happen, uh, then you get more carbon polarization. And then if you wait still longer, then of course you have relaxation again and uh, your carbon uh, signal uh, disappears again. And you can see in your sample, uh, then at very low fields, you very quickly lose the uh, polarization again. Um, and if you remove the oxygen, then that doesn't happen to the same extent. There's also, um, it also helps to, to anneal the sample. Um, so that way you deal with defects, uh, but that's maybe not not so relevant for, for our work here. So now what happens if we put trital in? So again, this uh, paper I mentioned earlier shows that if you go to a very low field with trital, actually, of course, of course, the, um, the line width doesn't disappear. So this line here basically goes to 10 megahertz. Uh, so you have a, a substantial zero field uh, line here. So you have, um, and um, so you have, of course, still the dipole-dipole interactions of the trital, and that gives you this non-Zeeman term. And you could, but you could also have, um, yeah, um, you also have this line width here, of course, and you can imagine that at a sufficiently low field, you can fit a nuclear Zeeman splitting into this field, right? Like when the proton frequency drops below 10 megahertz. And so what does this mean for the, thermal mixing experiments. So these are the experiments we've done. Um, um, uh, it means that we can have this transfer of polarization from protons to carbons at much higher field. So remember, if we don't have trital, it is cut off um, at 10 millitesla. And now here, if we go to even 200 millitesla, this is, would be the red curve here, you would still see that there is a degree uh, of thermal mixing. There's actually also some, there's always some uh, signal intensity here for the shortest mixing time. So that polarization must be transferred during the field ramps, which take rather substantial time compared to these time scales here. But how that exactly happens, maybe we don't, we don't understand fully. What you see also is that 20 millitesla, um, here you have the highest transfer and we actually get uh, like here, 40% thermal mixing efficiency. So 40% thermal mixing efficiency, that means that the carbon spins are cooled um, such that their polarization corresponds to 40% of that, what it would be if the carbons went all the way to the proton spin temperature without heating up the proton spins, which is a fair assumption because their heat capacity is much smaller. So even in the presence of oxygen, we get a fair transfer under suitable conditions. And we get this thermal mixing. We observe this at fields up to 100 millitesla. The good news for us, um, in a way, are that the relaxation looks manageable and also the thermal mixing looks manageable. Yeah, So there's a 
there's a degree of thermal mixing even at 100 millitesla, but it's small. And um, so that also corresponds to our experiments. But there's also an opportunity here because if we put the field to a smaller value and we start with proton polarization, then we can use that to transfer hyperpolarized proton polarization uh, to the carbon spins. At least that is what we would expect. So we haven't, we haven't tried that yet. Okay, so that concludes the first uh, or the, well, the main part of the talk. I also want to give an update on DNP activities at KIT. And uh, that will be, um, will be rather short. Um, what we have done um, when we moved from Southampton to, to Karlsruhe, we decided that we would build up everything again from scratch. And the setup in Southampton was using a wet cryostat. So we were using uh, liquid helium. We were just consuming helium uh, all the time and we run experiments. And so we are now very happy that we don't do that anymore. We have a, we've bought a dry magnet, one of these cryogenic magnets that also Jan Henrik is using and uh, I think everyone else as a matter of fact. Um, now there's a problem if we shoot out our bullets with pressurized helium gas with such a system then um, it's possible the magnet might quench which we don't want to happen every time we run the experiment. Um, so we build a new version of this DNP insert and that's actually ready and shown here and Karel took this uh, nice picture. Um, and here we actually uh, just have a small tube and we just have a small stream of helium gas which lifts the sample up outside the region of the, um, uh, of the liquid helium level. And then we have a big stream of helium gas coming in later, which you cannot see here. Uh, so this is a very nice picture. We also have a maybe less optimized picture here. This now shows our lab and you have the DNP magnet here with the microwave source and the insert in here. And um, what you can see on the screen here, this will be very familiar to you if you've done DNP uh, experiments, you can see the signal, the NMR signal growing after we switched on the microwave. Um, so that part of the system works, um, which is nice. And I would have loved to show, to show you a, a complete dissolution run. And I'm a bit sad that after now almost one and a half years at KIT, we don't have it yet. Um, it just does take considerable time to set up these uh, experiments. Um, what we did do though, we also worked on this injection element and this is shown here. So we, uh, we started to build a new um, injector. So this is again, this is the system that uh, where the bullet arrives and then the frozen material is dissolved in solvent and then it's injected into the NMR tube. And um, actually when I was still in Southampton, then Andrew Hall uh, pointed out to me that he had been working with uh, TGK Scientific before and they built the Bruker Inside Express. Um, and um, so they have a very nice uh, NMR tube, which you, you see a picture. Um, for, for stop flow measurements. So you can basically push liquid in and out and that works quite nicely. And so this is a computer design here. You have basically a flow path that connects to this uh, inner capillary here. And so via this, uh, and this is like a T piece, you can push the liquid in uh, into the NMR tube. And, um, uh, and then here we have valves and you can, uh, after the experiment, you can uh, then uh, also push the liquid out of the NMR tube again. So that's, um, that's something that we are quite fond of because what we want to build, of course, is a system where you don't have to do any manual labor after every run. So we want this ideally to run overnight um, and uh, we don't want to have to work for every single shot anymore. Yeah, we fed up with that. Um, and uh, so here uh, you can see that this actually quite nicely corresponds what we've built here to this drawing. And uh, we haven't drawn the top part of this thing really. Uh, I've just, I just show you a picture. So it, because we probably haven't put a lot of time into the design of it, it looks quite messy. But we have uh, here, this is for the waste material that would go in here. And then we have a bunch of valves to control all the flow and a bunch of solenoids to make sure that the uh, magnetic field is uh, always sufficiently high. 
And so as a, again, as I said, I don't have the um, full experiment recorded. We haven't done it yet. We haven't transferred a hyperpolarized solid and dissolved it yet. We hope we'll do it in the coming days, maybe in the coming weeks at, at worst. Um, but here is a, is a video that shows that th this is just basically a fake experiment where we just inject material into this NMR tube and then we also try to get it out again. And uh, you can see that this is, so this was actually recorded yesterday and we also put this together yesterday and debugged it yesterday and you can see that initially there was a little leak here. But um, yeah, let's just um, run the experiment. Okay. So that fills the, uh, you have this thing here now, it fills the NMR tube, so that worked nicely. And now we can also just clean it by just pushing it out again. Oh, sorry, I don't have to do that again. Yeah, so that's that. With that, I would like to thank uh, various people like in, uh, in Nottingham. Uh, many people have actually over time been involved in these field cycling experiments. Um, so David Pete uh, has done experiments for us, Ali Khan, David Galian, we've worked with him when we were there, I think the first time, maybe second time as well. James McDonald, Tony Horswell was there the first uh, time I, I came there and uh, it was nice to start working with the uh, experiment then, uh, with the setup there and John. Hannah has actually done the, recorded the bulk of the data in two sessions at Nottingham, so she's really done the, the uh, she's recorded the data that we now have and use. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Karel for his contributions and Lloyd who shared his uh, raw data with us so that we can really make these comparisons. And I'm very thankful to Tom for maybe hopefully putting us on the right path uh, so that we can make some sense of what we see. And for DNP at KIT, I would yeah, like to thank Karel, Hannah, Michael and Andrew. And I also would like to say, if, if you like these experiments, we have a crazy project uh, with uh, Arno is also in the audience, I believe. And so together with Arno, Jeffrey and Jan, and also Alva, we want to use hyperpolarization DNP for drug screening. So uh, we want to record uh, protein ligand binding, and we want to record that uh, at scale. And if that's something you would like to contribute to or be involved with, then please do get in touch. And with that, I would like to thank everyone um, 